And I'm going to post one thing on Twitter here before we get started. So that's working. The stream's on. Oh, and I didn't mention to you guys before we get started that um, if you can on your screen, you should be able to see a comment stream. Um, you won't be able to reply to the comments, but you can verbally reply to if somebody asks a question or something like that. I'll usually try to pull in a question or a comment and throw it up on the screen or just mention it um, so that we can respond to the people watching. Wow, we got 24 people already, just like that. Well, I'll get started here. Hello, and welcome to the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Podcast, as a wrap. I am uh, your host, Raj Gupta. I'm, gonna be, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm going to be moderating or co-moderating this poster session with my guest today. Uh, before we get started, I want to emphasize a couple things. Uh, we aren't going to be talking about COVID-19 today, so that's good news if you want to hear about other stuff. Um, what we're going to be talking about is preliminary research work. These are actually going to be medically challenging cases, so they're not even case series or um, full case reports yet. Um, and so these aren't, these aren't gone, haven't gone through full peer review. Take all the information as preliminary. Uh, if you are going to comment, which I encourage you to do in the comment stream, um, be kind in your commentary. There's a place. For, uh, this is a place for constructive criticism, but we're not trying to shame or blame or badger anybody. Um, and uh, there are a ton of medically challenging cases. So go to the e-posters website and look at all the others. There's lots of other media on there. Um, so uh, we're not even showing you videos and audio clips that people have contributed in alongside their posters. So there's a lot of high quality content. And Azra is making that poster website free for right now, so it's a good opportunity to go and check that out. Um, I am the lead developer of the Azra Last and Azra Coags app, which may come up today. I don't know. I'm just disclosing that. I don't make any money from those apps, but my institution does get some um, profits from the sales of those. And uh, if you are an author of one of these uh, uh, medically challenging cases and you have time, uh, put a little comment in the comment field. I'll see if I can get you to jump into the conversation. I'd love to have you talk about your own uh, poster if possible. I think we're going to have one guest on today, but other people are welcome to jump in. Tomorrow, just to put it on your calendar, at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, we're going to be talking about erector spinae blocks, uh, posters that are uh, referencing erector spinae blocks. And our guests tomorrow are going to be Daniel Ludwin, Kijin Chin, and Vishal Upo, uh, along with Nabil. And uh, I think that's going to be a great conversation. Uh, lots of posters on erector spinae blocks. So we're going to focus on that tomorrow. Without much further ado, I'm going to bring the rest of our guests in. So we've got an esteemed panel with us today. Uh, first off, Jamie. Jamie brought us the chair of this uh, Azra Spring meeting. She didn't get to show off all the hard work she did, so we want to show off some of the stuff that she pulled together with this week and some of the stuff coming up in the next few weeks. Jamie, welcome. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. And uh, and another guest of ours, Nadia Hernandez, coming to us from Texas. Nadia, how are you? Wonderful. Thanks again for having me. And we've got Nabil with us again. So, Nabil, hello again. Hi, Raj. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> yeah, we had a great response for the show yesterday. I think we're up to about thirteen or fourteen hundred views and growing. Those are still available online um, on all Azra's uh, media channels, and so you can go over there and review that video. We had a great conversation both Monday and Tuesday. So, um, well, let's get started so we can talk about the posters. Uh, let me put the first one up here, and I'm going to try if I can keep up. Uh, I'll tell you the poster number, and then also I'll put a link in the comment field so that you can uh, get the direct link to the e-poster online. So the first one is poster 717, and let me get the link here, and I'll put it on there. Uh, 
Okay, so this one uh, is entitled Continuous Combined Fascial Plane Blocks for an Emergency Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Repair. This is coming from Brigham and Women's and Harvard Medical School. Um, it, this was an example of a case, a 79-year-old woman who came in with a uh, uh, infrarenal abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm and um, had some other mo um, comorbidities that made her at higher risk for um, post-operative respiratory depression with opioids, uh, specifically COPD with some oxygen use. And the surgery was urgent enough that they didn't feel like they had time for a preoperative epidural. Um, and so they uh, went to the operating room, did general anesthesia, and they were looking for pain control for afterwards. And what was interesting about this case is instead of doing tap blocks and rectus blocks, and instead of doing four catheters, they put two catheters, fenestrated catheters per side, and sort of spanned both the rectus sheath and the transversus abdominis plane in one pass um, so that there were ports that were open in the rectus sheath and open in the transversus abdominis plane, and then ran those continuously as continuous infusions. I'll uh, zoom in a little bit here in a second. I'll show you kind of their diagram for how they approach the angle of approach to try to cross both of those lines. And if you can view the ultrasound, I'll show you the ultrasound images here in a second as well. And they found remarkably good control of pain for this patient as long as they ran the catheter. The patient ended up having some other complications related to spinal cord uh, infarct and ischemia, but uh, not specifically related to pain control. And they felt like this was a reasonable alternative option to an epidural or an alternative option to four uh, abdominal wall catheters. Um, Jamie, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. You know, I don't know if you guys have done anything quite like this. I know I haven't. Um, any thoughts about this sort of spanning technique of catheters? I think it's interesting. I would like to have definitely seen how they physically, you know, did it to ensure that the catheter kind of stayed in that plane. Um, I'm also interested that it seems like they just ran a continuous infusion um, at a fairly low rate. I don't, I didn't really notice that they used any intermittent bolusine or anything like that, which I would have thought would have been a little more effective or useful. Um, so I did just like with that small of volume, you know, running hourly to be able to kind of maintain that pain control was interesting. Yeah, they said four mLs per hour, if I read that yeah. right. Yeah, I was. Exactly. Uh, I'm guessing four mLs per hour per catheter, which I yeah. don't think I ever run anything that low. Almost. <laughs> no, I just it just seems like so small amount to really cover that wide of a plane. Yeah, Nadia, do you guys do abdominal wall blocks, and do you see this as a solution for your patient population? Um, we usually try to go a little bit more posterior to also cover visceral pain. We have had patients with um, aortic aneurysm repair who complain of back pain, which is more of a referred pain, I guess, from the aneurysm and the surgery in that in that region. And we found a lot of success with the retrospinal plane blocks. I mean, I think if the patient is localizing their pain just to the abdominal wall, this is a reasonable alternative. But technically, post-op, um, you know, putting in these catheters on someone who is, you know, difficult to sedate, it, it can be very challenging. So I commend them for doing, you know, any type of regional technique on this patient. Mm -hmm. and, and Nabil, I, I'm wondering what kind of catheter they used, if they used a standard catheter or some different fenestrations, because I'm not sure how you line up the holes where it's going to feed into both fascial planes. Yeah. So the, if, if I'm getting this correctly, this is not your, uh, your standard catheter. We actually looked into this, and this is a type of catheter that the surgeons use when they put the catheter inside the wound or subcutaneous. Okay. And we looked into that. We looked into that for a couple of things. We looked into it for uh, rib fractures to put it in uh, the ESP plane or the serratus plane block. But what we found that to put this catheter, this catheter is a little bit bigger, and it has like multiple fenestration. So to put it, I think you have to use the two here, and the two here that you use with would gonna be 16 gauge. Unless, like, you know, they use, like, you know, a special kit. But what we looked at before was just uh, the same catheter that the surgeons use, but it has to be fitting into the uh, a much bigger TUI. So that's, like, you know, one consideration. Um, I think they need to be commended. I mean, it's it's a decent alternative for epidural in a lot of cases if you're in a hurry or if you're anticoagulation status. And it's going to be definitely better than not having anything on board. 
Yeah, we looked at these uh, multi-fenestrated catheters before, and my biggest problem with them has been that when you run them at low flow rates, it seems like all of the medicine comes out the most proximal hole. And so I don't know how you drive local. Say, I, I mean, like Jamie was saying, intermittent bolus seems like a better choice that you might be able to spread over the both planes in a mm-hmm. in a better way than to run a low uh, infusion rate. I wonder if they had to go back and manually bolus periodically to try to get them caught up. Maybe, yeah. Any other thoughts on this one? I thought it was an interesting uh, concept. I know that we've tried sometimes to do. Um, for some of our patients, for a variety of reasons, we've tried to do our um, uh, tap blocks right behind um, the rectus sheath, the lateral border of the rectus sheath, and try to do the tap block there more anteriorly, particularly for things like um, colostomy revisions or um, uh, uh, or some sort of ports or something yeah. like that. And so it seems like a target that's relatively easy to get to, and I could see how you could span both of them in a relatively yeah. small area. Yeah, but also the one thought that I have, and this is a question for you guys, you just uh, educate me. Like, you know, now when they did the tap block, so the need for the tap block and on top of it is a rectus sheath block. I mean, do you guys do that, like, you no know, often? Like, you no, know, every time you do a tap block, you do a rectus sheath block with it? Or would one of them is going to be substitute to the other or not? Anyway, we'll jump in. Go ahead, Jamie. I mean, it kind of depends on what, you know, case they're doing. So not necessarily kind of look at where everything's going to be, but I don't, you know, I don't have a great answer because I don't know that we fully understand everything about them. Yeah. yeah we really so, uh, do more posteriorly. We, we, we hardly ever do these blocks anymore. Yeah. So um, Steve um, Porter kind of put a comment in here that it's kind of an interesting thing afterthought which is an epidural might have clouded the spinal cord infarct diagnosis too and so that's that's a fair point you know and and um something that we have to uh think about as well mm-hmm. all right i'm going to move to the next poster so we have time um this one is number one two five five and i'm gonna put the link and i've tried to group these so they're sort of thematic here so Hopefully we'll have some. Yeah. So Raj, before uh, before you move, actually, it's interesting. I got a an answer on text message from one of our friends who's listening, but I guess he's too shy to, to put a comment. He says <laughs> like, yeah. He says like, no, why put the catheter through the rectus when you're already doing tap? Question mark. You're covering the anterior cutaneous branch with the tap, so the rectus sheath is redundant. Okay. So my my primary answer to that is actually how. Um, uh, cephalad you need to try to reach. And and so the reason I usually do rectus sheath blocks is for an incision that's sub-xiphoid. And, um, and I don't feel like tap block reaches that high. And so it's, it's not necessarily a, a lateral and medial or anterior uh, separation that I'm worried about. It's the caudal and cephalad uh, spread. So that's typically so. And they describe in their diagram an incision that goes to sub-xiphoid. And so that's a situation that um, yeah. I feel like a rectus it helps. Yeah, that's James Kim, by the way. He's, oh, he uh, didn't want to be revealed. So <laughs> exactly. You he's, just outed him. Okay. Yeah, he's just too shy. <laughs> he's been on the show before, so he's not that shy. Um, okay, so let's talk about this next one. So like I said, it's poster number 1255. Um, I, I may skip the next one on the list because we had hoped to get our guest on to speak about that one. So we'll come back to that one if we if they're not on by then. Um, this one's compartment syndrome masked by epidural after open reduction and internal fixation of tibial plateau fracture and then ultimately leads to an amputation. This comes from University of California in San Diego. Um, and this was a case report of a 30-year-old who suffered a skateboarding accident and a um, tibial plateau fracture. They ended up having an epidural um, at, a, at the facility that they had their surgery and the epidural was removed 24 hours later. Um, after the uh, epidural was removed, there was a sensory deficit and inability to dorsiflex or plantar flex the toes two hours after the epidural was removed. It was thought that the epidural was still residual. The patient was actually discharged home to follow up in clinic. A week later, he was uh, readmitted uh, from the clinic, continued to have a non-healing wound, and had another surgery for debridement. Um, and then transferred to the hospital that's reporting this. 
Um, at their institution, they found that he had significant loss of nerve uh, function in the anterior compartment, unable to plantar and dorsiflex against resistance, um, ended up uh, found out to have significant sequelae of compartment syndrome, and ultimately had a um, amputation. Um, they did a femoral and sciatic nerve catheter for post-operative pain relief, and they continued that on for um, the time uh, for four or five days afterwards. So um, the point uh, of the story is, of course, the question about compartment syndrome. And um, Nadia, I'll start with you. Um, I, I don't know how much trauma you guys deal with. I'm guessing quite a bit. Um, and I wonder uh, how you guys interpret the risk of compartment syndrome, particularly with these um, high-velocity injuries um, and in certain bony regions, and the sort of dispute about whether any kind of regional masks um, the finding of a compartment syndrome? Well, this is quite the question. This is actually the bane of my existence. We are, we're the busiest trauma center um, in the U.S. And pretty much all of our cases are trauma. Um, the way the surgeons explain it to me is having a compartment syndrome to them is like a lost airway to an anesthesiologist. Very, very big deal to them. And, you know, you can do dilute infusions of, of local anesthetic that will give you pain control, but won't mask the pain that comes with compartment syndrome. And uh, we used to do that. Um, however, if that if there is a change in pain, having a catheter in place or having a block that may have worn off, it just muddies the waters. You know, is it the catheter? Is it the block? Um, who should evaluate the patient? And if there's a delay in diagnosis, then the patient can end up with a permanent nerve injury. So we've come to the agreement um, that we block everything except for certain surgeries. Um, tibial plateau fractures is one of the one of the procedures that we do not block, whether it's repaired with a nail or ORIF. Um, the other procedure is a, a double bone forearm um, fixation. We just don't don't do regional for those procedures, just so that um, because we understand that here at at Herman we are we are understaffed. There's not we don't have a bunch of nurse practitioners, residents, you know, rounding on the patients at night. And so we do what we can with um, ketamine infusions and lidocaine infusions and perioperative methadone to help these patients with pain instead. So Jamie, um, trauma uh, and compartment syndromes, what do you think? I mean, we similarly with our, you know, spoken to our orthopedic trauma guy and, you know, he definitely is, feels a lot the same. And this tibial plateau also is something that he does not want, you know, we do not do any regional for um, a case by case basis, sometimes postoperatively, but, but rarely. Mm -hmm. So it really is, you know, this injury, you know, appears to be one of the ones that they're definitely most concerned about. So, you know, regional probably isn't the best thing to do in these situations, given the high risk. So, I mean, we always like to say that it doesn't mask compartment syndrome, but, you know, based on the literature in cases like this, it, it, it can. I mean, obviously, we don't know what was running through the epidural because it's really not mentioned here, but, um, you know, this was an unfortunate complication. Um, Jan Bublik putting a comment in here. He said that if you're really concerned about compartment syndrome, maybe do a fasciectomy like we do awake. Um, so I, I think the question is not when the decision is made that there's a compartment syndrome. The question is, is well before that, um, is, is what's the right thing to do? Uh, Nabil, uh, you know, I, what's frustrating about these cases, the tibial plateaus, which I take care of a lot of as well, is that they hurt so bad. Um, these patients hurt quite a bit and you know, you can make them feel better, but, um, but, uh, there are significant consequences to that. Yeah, I think like you know, similar to Jamie and Nadia and yourself, the key is to just talk to your surgeons and just see what is the what's going on. And it's always a challenge whether you catch these cases, which is more prone to development of compartment syndrome ahead of the surgery or just after the fact. Sometimes if you did like a multimodal analgesia and consent the patient for a block and just see how they come out. And a lot of times, like you know, on exam, either post-op or as they're closing, they're gonna tell us like you know, how the tissues look like, if the tissues are too tight or they feel like you know, the tissues are relaxed. So sometimes like you know, we can send patients for blocks and as they close, they say, by the way, like you know, the patient is okay to have block, it seems to be the tissues are not like you know, very tense and they are relaxed. But, and also on that note, like you know, the surgeon would alert like you know, their residents that they have to be on the alert 
for any pain out of proportion okay to the post-operative pain so i think discussion and talking is like you know to other parties is the key to uh diagnosis of these compartment syndromes you know the way i had it explained to me once by a surgeon and kind of when we were discussing this in the past is that um as anesthesiologists as nadia was referring to as anesthesiologists we have sort of a um irrational fear of aspiration um related to airway management um if you really look at the risk of aspiration and what measures we go through to prevent it from occurring including case cancellations for somebody chewing gum you know that used to be not uncommon um and mainly it's because if anything happens it's completely on us right that's our 100 percent our responsibility and i think the surgeons view compartment syndrome the same way and they kind of drilled into their head throughout their training that if the compartment syndrome happens, it's the orthopedic surgeon's fault, right? And and it's a it's a never type of event. And so I think that we have to have a respect that that's a primary fear of theirs. Just like they, you know, we, we tend to um, sometimes overdo the concern about aspiration. Yeah, but also like you know, the other point from that case, I'm gonna ask you guys, what is the discharge criteria if somebody is still complaining of pain and numbness before they are discharged? When you let them go, is there like you know, a rigorous follow-up, like a you know, regimen? Are you going to say to everybody, we're going to call you in 24 hours, 48 hours? Because you said that this person had numbness before they go home. I mean, I definitely, if we did a block and had someone who had residual numbness, I definitely want to you know, have some sort of follow-up with them. So I think it shows that we can't just block people and send them out and not worry about what happens when they go home. So. We do have to at do minim at minimum well. a phone call, right? Yeah, at minimum <laughs> a phone call, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one here. Um, so we've got um, s number 650, 650, um, and I'm putting the link here. This one is entitled Neuraxial Anesthesia and Lower Extremity Peripheral Nerve Blocks for Ankle Surgery in a Patient with Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy. Um, this is from the Weill Cornell, uh, Cornell Medicine Group at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, which has been a busy place these days. Um, and uh, so this one is a 58-year-old woman who had a history of CIDP and uh, obstructive sleep apnea who came in for outpatient surgery for ankle ORF for a trimal ankle fra fracture. Um, and uh, had not complete onset of symptoms, but had some neurologic deficits, some weakness issues, particularly in distal extremities. Um, and the question was, is how do you safely do the anesthetic? The debate was, is general anesthesia has been shown to exacerbate these inflammatory polyneuropathies, and um, is regional anesthesia safe? In this case, they went forward with a, a combined spinal epidural for the case with the possibility of nerve blocks post-op when the epidural wore off and they um, uh, uh, tried to treat the patient with opioids. She still had significant pain, 10 out of 10 pain. They ultimately ended up doing a popliteal and adductor canal blocks, um, and she had much better pain control at that point. So the question is, is... Yeah, you know, do you feel quite comfortable doing peripheral nerve blocks on these patients? What about spinals, epidurals, um, and how do you interpret pre-existing neuropathy in, in patients that, with, um, uh, that need regional anesthesia? In this case, interestingly enough, she did have an aggravation of her um, uh, inflammatory neuropathy, but the thought was it was more related to the stress of surgery rather than the, um, the nerve blocks themselves. So Nabil, I'll start with you. Um, and uh, and I saw Iman. Iman, I saw you coming into the the on deck here. Let's finish with this poster, and we'll go to yours next, and we'll let you present yours uh, right after this one. So I'll get you on in a second. Go ahead, Nabil. So I would say the key to this is uh, we actually we don't know. We don't have like solid evidence to go by. We have some retrospective studies about uh, patient with pre-existing neuropathy and how safe like you know is regional anesthesia in these cases and i think it's going to come down to your risk benefit and a very frank discussion with the patient and just inform them like you know about the risk of the regional anesthesia and uh, and all that and at the end of the day if they are willing to proceed okay you proceed but i will just like you know put a word of caution like you know you document this discussion as much as you can 
document, document, document. You know, I personally have been burned, like, you know, by discussing with some patient and they are fully on board and fully disclosing the risk. And then after the post-op, like, you know, nerve deficit, okay, I'm just essentially some uh, finger pointing. So I would say document your discussion and um, this is the only thing you can do. And if you want to be more conservative, just look for other alternative other than regional anesthesia. Jamie, how do you uh, how do you see this as an if you were if this patient presented in front of you, would you do these blocks? I mean, I think again, I, I agree with Nabil, and I think it's I think you know discussion you have with the patient, you explain the risks, you document the risks, you do document their you know, preliminary neurologic exam, so you have a baseline, um, and then you know it's it's if you think it's going to be a benefit and the patient agrees or wants it, I think you can make an informed decision and go forth. And as I mentioned, they use less local. You could use a more dilute local anesthetic as well uh, to possibly, you know, decrease risk. So there's options that you can do. And I've been faced with different patients with different types of neurologic disorders. And I think, you know, it's, it's definitely an option. We don't have to shy away from it, um, but we can make a good clinical decision, um, you know, with our patients. And Nadia, these guys decided not to put a catheter in, and they didn't put any adjuvants in. I, I, I kind of would feel comfortable putting a catheter in this patient. I don't know if you would or not. What do you think? I think this is a, a very painful procedure that I would normally put a catheter in for. Um, if you're going to do a regional anesthetic, um, you might as well do what you think is best for the case. Uh, I agree with you. I would put a catheter in as well. Um, yeah, it's a, these are always a challenge anytime you have somebody with a neuropathy of any kind um, trying to figure out what's the best way forward. But um, I think that we shouldn't shy away from regional anesthesia if, if possible. I think in most cases, it's probably still the better of other choices. Um, so, Iman, if you are on, I don't know if you have your mic and your video. Oh, there she is. Hi. Hello. Hello. I wanted to thank you for uh, participating in these uh, live streams the last few days too. That you've been so kind and uh, offering some good commentary. Um, awesome. I love it. Great, and mm -hmm. I'm going to put your poster up here. Um, this is uh, poster number one one zero eight, <clears throat> and uh, let me put the link in the stream here so people can jump to it, and then uh, I'll let you present it, which is even better. Okay. Okay, go for it. And if you want me to zoom in on a part, just let me know. But go okay. ahead. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, my residents wanted to come, but actually they are committed to their calls, and it was like a, a short notice for them, so we uh, we were not able to get them here. Anyway, so this is like uh, 15 years old who presented for an outpatient surgery. He had osteochondromas at... Um, the lower uh, medial part of the femur, and we can zoom on the first uh, image. Uh, so the plan was um, like uh, the surgeon wanted to excise these uh, tumors, and uh, he asked us for a block uh, before he starts the surgery, and since he was uh, a child, uh, we did the block, uh, since it's on the medial side of the femur, uh, we decided to do an adductor canal single shot block, and we did that after induction. Uh, the procedure went on eventually, and the patient needed very little uh, narcotics, and everything went well until the patient went to um, uh, arrive to the recovery room. Uh, Fifteen minutes after, I find the PACU nurse calling us, and uh, she is telling us like nothing works with this patient. The patient is having severe pain. So first thing, uh, first thing I thought about like the block is not working. Looks like. There is a problem with the block. So the patient was in a brace, in a new brace. So I asked the patient, he was 13 years old, intelligent boy, um, where's your pain? Uh, he said, like, he couldn't pinpoint the pain. He said, it's in my leg. So we were not sure where's the pain uh, coming from. So we had to remove the brace, and I tested the site of uh, the supposedly the doctor can have blocked the medial side of the um tie at the leg and uh, he was not feeling much and it looked like the block worked later on we kept like sitting by the patient asking the nurse to be, uh, the nurse to give more diluted but the pain is increasing and the patient getting increasingly uncomfortable and now he says the pain is in the leg and is in the foot 
So we called the surgeon immediately. I was thinking like, what happened? The, they might have extended the incision. They did something inside that we don't know. So we called the surgeon immediately and the surgeon came and um, uh, he did not find an explanation for that. Uh, the first thing uh, he said, let's um, uh, feel the pulse. So he tried to feel the pulse. Uh, he could feel the dyslexic with difficulty, or actually they didn't feel it, they doppled it. And uh, they uh, heard it like with difficulty. Uh, then as uh, the case continued to evolve, the leg is becoming dusky, and the swelling started to show up at the lower end of the thigh. So then like when uh, I, uh, I got the surgeon, uh, like, what do you think is this gonna be? Like, is this normal? Yeah, first they uh, dismissed the, um, uh, the decreased uh, pulse. They said um, uh, an arterial spasm could happen in these cases and that's not uncommon. So when the leg started to swell at the thigh uh, and the leg became dusky, we became more concerned. Uh, so um, I took the ultrasound and looked on the back, trying to find the popliteal artery, see how far, like, uh, can we see the popliteal artery since we don't feel uh, the dorsalis pedis, uh, like we do for the popliteal nerve block. Uh, I couldn't see the popliteal artery, and uh, we saw like hypo uh, hypoechoic. Uh, I can't say mass, but it's the area is all black. Uh, so we became more concerned. I uh, advised him, let's go and get the vascular surgery here. So the vascular surgery came immediately. This is like half an hour from uh, coming from the OR. Uh, came immediately and they uh, brought their sophisticated ultrasound and they ultrasound the artery from the top down all the way down. And they confirmed there is an obstruction, there's a big hematoma. Uh, that's compressing the lower end of SFA down to the popliteal artery. Uh, so and um, so we're, we're thinking, and they did the Doppler again and everything, and like it seemed like there is an obstruction. So uh, they decided to put the case as a level A and go to the OR, and the case went to the OR within the hour. They went in the OR, and when they explored the wound, they found, yeah, they... Uh, uh, didn't want to waste time to send the patient for angio uh, uh, with the radiology, so they went to the OR and they got the uh, CR and they explored the wound and they found uh, laceration of the lower end of the SFA close to where they uh, excised the uh, osteochondrome. So they repaired with a patch, uh, they did come back to me, uh, the tissues were soft, so there was no need for um, fasciotomy. And after that, the patient went to the studio and he was uh, followed up there and he continued to recover. Um, every day he was doing better, some patients came back to normal and the foot was saved and I think that was a good outcome. So the take home message from, uh, this, um, uh, from this case is like early intervention is very important in vascular um, issues. Uh, this is presented as a compartment syndrome, uh, which is uh, like, uh, as the panel said earlier, it's a very big concern for orthopedic surgeries. And it's a concern for us all, also because whenever we put a block, like it confounds the um, clinical picture, but sometimes you're uh, put in a very uh, difficult situation. Uh, you have this trauma guy who's a um, drug abuser and nothing works with them and you want to put a block. And at the same time, they are worried about the compartment syndrome. So that was a concern for us. So our differential diagnosis, we ran the differential diagnosis in our heads before we go to the OR. We thought like it's a failed block. So that uh, was excluded when we found like the sensations are decreased in the distribution of the uh, safness. Uh, the second thing we thought like we, it might have been a trauma from us placing the needle. Uh, but uh, after they came from the OR, they said the laceration was at the lower end of the SFA, far away from where we placed the needle. And the needle, like the procedure was easy, non-complicated, single shot. So we don't think we did any trauma to the artery. Uh, the other thing we thought like thrombosis of the artery or laceration, and that would not uh, been diagnosed without, um, without an angio or without um, an uh, exploration. 
so this is like the, uh, the take home message is the early diagnosis, the involvement for services, including all people. For the surgeons, they would think that the block for us, no, the distribution of the pain and prestige was the distribution of the popliteal, which we never touch it. And this is this was very a very important differentiating point. So, uh, yeah, and so, we got uh, that the surgeon involved earlier. That all helped. Yeah. So great. I just uh, I got a text message from Raj like we lost him, but he's gonna be coming <laughs> back soon. Uh, so, Iman, that, this is a great case, and uh, and essentially, I'm gonna play Raj here until he comes back. <laughs> so, uh, Jamie, like you know, we're gonna start off with you. Have you seen anything like that before, Jamie? Compartment syndrome from an adductor canal block. I mean, do we think it was necessarily the block, or just from the? Was it from the surgery? I think that it actually occurred. Is that correct? Yeah, from the surgery. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but so I think that. I mean, I haven't seen or been involved in a situation like that, but I mean, obviously, I think it's. Uh, you know, we back. know the adductor canal block was he's not going to cause mm -hmm. that loss of function. So yeah. you know, I think it's important that we again, it's following up with our patients in the PACU. You know, doing exams um, and also participating. You know, in in that follow up. Yeah, I will. I will tell you that uh, the main reason I was asking you that question because I have actually seen two cases like this before with a doctor canal. One was a someone who went home with a an adductor canal catheter, and the other one was status post knee arthroplasty, and actually the patient has fasciotomy and did great after that. And the, for the fasciotomy patient that we did actually an MRA on that patient, um, MR uh, angio, and there was no vascular injury, like you know, for the artery or for the vein, like you know, afterwards. So it remains to be a mystery. But the patient presented with the classic presentation of a compartment syndrome, like you know the leg was swollen and it was, it's the thigh. So for the thigh to present with a compartment syndrome, that needs to be a significant presentation, a significant amount of blood to be accumulated. It's not like the tight compartment of the leg. The thigh can accommodate up to one or two liters of blood. The other thing, especially with the ductal canal block, you probably have heard about like you know, some cases of the myotoxicity or the myonecrosis or the ductal canal block. So the point when uh, Raj and I were talking about cases to select, I just don't want people to take the adductor canal block lightly or just say it is a safe block. And this block has to be respected like you know, uh, all the way around. Nadia, do you have any, uh, any comments on the case? I think this is a really great case that highlights uh, the importance of um, you know, being a physician and not just uh, someone who does a block. You know, when sometimes when we block our patients post-op, you know, and they become hypotensive, it's it, it's not necessarily because of you know local anesthetic toxicity that everybody screams. Um, it sometimes, and this has happened to me, where you know you do um, a paravertebral block, and their pain that was supporting their blood pressure is now gone, <laughs> and all of a sudden they're hypotensive, and you end up resuscitating the patient, and so. Um, this is really great because it shows that not they just weren't treating the pain; they were they were being physicians and taking care of the patient, and which led to the diagnosis that helped save their limbs. So I really commend them for this. Yeah. And In those see, situations where where you had the adductor canal blocks in the compartment syndrome, how did you like? Did you sit think it was like the adductor canal block that caused it, or the surgery, the tourniquet, all the other things that could have been the issue, or is it just yeah. a contributing so, factor? So initially, the thought process, at least for our case, was it maybe have been an initial vascular injury, like you know, from the block placement, but that would have shown up on the MRA, on the MRA study, that you would see a vascular injury and you'd see a leak, like you know, mm -hmm. in the study. But also remember, like when you put it, especially after TKA, that you put it and you put a tourniquet, like you know, above it. So that that might be a contributing factor. Surgery may have to play also, like you know, another role. And I see a comment also here from Helen from Penn State. She's also saying that they had a compartment syndrome after a, an adductor canal block before. So even just right in these past five minutes, like, you know, we talked about like you know, four cases of compartment syndrome. And I'll tell you, as of a year ago, the, the last time I looked, there was about only 10 cases of compartment syndrome with peripheral nerve blocks. So that also go to make the point why we selected that case. Actually, the incidence of these things can be a lot higher. So this is not something that we should be taking lightly. And it's a complex area because of all the different possible etiologies. So exactly. we're not saying that the catheter causes all compartment syndromes, but is in the differential um, when looking at it. Iman, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you. I'm going to take you off the screen now, and we're going to move on to the next poster. Um, 
Thank you again. And, and Nabil, thanks for helping me out there. My home Wi-Fi decided to go kaput for a few <laughs> moments, but uh, you carried well. Um, let's go on to the next poster here. Uh, let me get that screen back up. See, I'm getting uh, Nabil trained on how to do this hosting stuff here. So Yeah, he's getting me trained on playing Raj in my <laughs> spare time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this next one, uh, here's the link for it. And uh, it's poster number 704. Um, atypical presentation of suspected local anesthetic systemic toxicity following continuous subpectoral parasternal blocks. And this is from Harvard uh, Medical School and Brigham and Women's. Um, in this case, there was a uh, patient who had a 53 year old man who had a bicuspid aortic valve and aortic stenosis operation with a, um, I think, a midline sternotomy. Um, Bilateral subpectoral parasternal catheters were placed. Uh, it looks like they were running 1/8% bupivacaine at 5 mL per hour per side, and the patient was doing well. Post-op day two, the patient said that he was having some vivid auditory hallucinations. There was some music in the room to help him meditate. They turned that off. He was still hearing audio uh, um, hallucinations, so uh, no other symptoms of local anesthetic toxicity. There were uh, a few, uh, a little bit of ectopy on his EKG when they looked back at his tracings, but that's not super surprising after somebody who had heart surgery. And then they turned off the catheters, and within 60 minutes, his uh, hallucinations went away and his PVCs went away. Um, so they didn't have to treat the uh, local anesthetic toxicity other than stopping the uh, the infusions. But um, so the, the conversation on this is one, the parasternal blocks and uh, two, um, local anesthetic toxicity with such a low dose. Um, I, I'll let you guys uh, pipe in. I don't know who does these on any regular basis, but um, I, I would be curious to know what your thoughts are on why this would be a higher risk place for toxicity. Anybody do these? We do these. Uh, we don't do catheters, we do single shots. Um, that, that's such a low dose for an infusion. I suspect that the catheter may have been partially intravascular. Yeah. Um, I really don't think that at those doses and at that low of a rate that the patient would have, you know, an absorption issue um, causing low blood pressure toxicity. Now, is there is there some higher uh, number of vasculature in this area that you know of, Nadia, that is more concerning for absorption? I mean, I, I, you know, when I've studied this block, I haven't done that many of them, but um, when I've studied it, I don't see it as a high risk area other than any other intercostal kind of injection. Um, Nabil, any thoughts on this? I mean, it's kind of a strange um, yeah. scenario. It is. And I think like, you know, the take home point like from that case is, as you alluded to, it's a, the atypical presentation of the last. So this is something that we have to be cognizant of. Last is not always going to present with somebody seizing and they are having like you no know, ectopy. So you have to be alert on change of mental status, auditory or visual hallucination. You have to be thinking about that. The other thing about the uh, these blocks, so let me just tell you a story. Uh, by the way, when you say, when you start telling stories about things, that's a sign that you're getting older. So that, you know, yeah. Have you been able to get to the salon and dye your gray hair yet? Or? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we, we actually we toyed like you know, with these blocks like you know, for a for a while, and we even got to the point that we were comparing like you know what we do versus what the surgeon would claim that they do the subpectoral block, and clearly like what we're doing were, was better. However, okay, the concern was they would not let us just anywhere close to their incision, especially with a sternotomy and a cardiac surgery, because of the infection risk. So when we did these blocks, we used to actually uh, scrub and uh, scrub in, right, while the uh, and do them. So that was painful. The other thing also in any patient who's having a cabbage, they were afraid that we're gonna there is injury to the internal mammary artery. The internal mammary artery is actually very close, and you can cause like a significant bleeding, and you can hurt like you know, where the site that you get the harvest from. So that's why we started to look at other options, like you know, to get away from the parasternal block. And now, like when we do them, when we do them for certain indication, we can do like you know, ESP or like you know, other blocks. So I would say if there is any vasculature, I don't know if the antenna mammary would be a culprit here, 
maybe or maybe not. I mean, you have to essentially have to be there, like you know, to put the cast and just see if this is a was the case or not. And and Jamie, the um, local anesthetic toxicity, I think, and Nabil sort of hinted at this, but I actually think that quote unquote normal local anesthetic toxicity is sort of gone by the wayside because we don't see that very often. Most of the cases are going to be abnormal ones. Do you guys see a lot of abnormal presentation? A lot mean as a percentage of overall. I mean, we don't see it very much at all anymore. But I mean, the few the few we've had were actually pretty typical um, yeah. and ended up with seizure. There was like, I think, two, you know, in my time. So yeah. they were pretty classic. But I think, you know, I think especially with, we have to think, like you said, anytime you have any kind of CNS symptoms, you know, whether they are the classic ones or anything like hallucinations or anything at all, you have to think about it, you know, and just always, if you know, a catheter is running, it still just has to be your differential when anything's unusual. Um, but, and I think it's hard to even think about that because the patient could have been on pain meds and other things that can cloud the picture. They're in the hospital. Many times people have strange, you know, hallucination type reactions to that. So I, I think that we definitely could, you know, learn from this to, you know, just remember to keep it on a differential, even though it's so rare. Yeah. And someone suggested here that it could be an intrapleural migration and, I don't know if that would increase the um, blood concentration of local anesthetic. Anyway, an interesting conversation. I think it's a good reminder that atypical presentations of local anesthetic are still something that need to be in the differential. Um, so we're not spending much time this week talking about point-of-care ultrasound. So there were a couple of um, posters on that. I thought it'd be good to bring those up. So this one is uh, poster number 1041. Um, let me put the link up here. I think, um, Nabil, you had picked this article. I did. Um, I, I picked these two because I knew that Nadia is coming on. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, when I went to the course, I think uh, she barely passed me. Like, no, I was a bad student. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about this one. This is coming from University of Illinois Hospital Health Sciences Center in Chicago. It's called Point of Care Ultrasound to Evaluate Severe Interoperative Hypotension. And in this case, um, it's a 65-year-old woman who was having uh, multiple lumbar fusions, uh, L3 through 5 and L2 through 3 um, inner body fusions. And uh, they had started the case, turned prone, um, the whole gamut was going on. And it says two hours after incision. So they were in the operating room for quite a while. Patient became severely hypotensive and refractory to treatment. They ended up closing the back and turning the patient back supine, did um, a point of care ultrasound exam, and they saw a mass uh, in the heart, I believe uh, in the right atrium. Um, by the time they got cardiology involved to do a more thorough exam, the intracardiac mass was gone. They did a CTA PE protocol, and they found a large left lower lobar um, pulmonary embolus. So um, they were the early diagnosis with this POCUS um, tool that they had in the operating room. It, I was As I was reading this case, I was like, did they do it on their while they're still prone uh, somehow. That's what I was thinking that this was going. I was like, that would have been really cool. Somehow they figured out how to do it while they're still upside down. But anyway, it's still a, quite a, a remarkable uh, success uh, in, and probably saved this woman's life. Nadia, your thoughts on um, this kind of use case where we have weird hypotension in the operating room? Oh, it's been so useful. And I can't tell you how many stories we have like this. Um, and, and, and I commend them for doing point of care ultrasound and expediting the care for this patient. But um, there are times where, you know, even after induction, you know, patients that you don't expect, at least in, in a trauma center, um, that come from home are hypotensive after very, very small doses of propofol. And we find these large effusions and we find, um, all these things that we would have normally said, well, I, I don't know, I don't know what happened, but they're fine now. <laughs> so it's it's actually very helpful. And um, I was also wondering how they were able to do that prone at first until I saw. That they had to yeah, I had to read that carefully. Um, Jamie, are you guys uh, having the opportunity to use point of care ultrasound a little bit more often? We are trying to. I mean, there's a couple of us that have taken the course. Um, that know how to do it. So we're trying to, especially um, encouraging the residents, you know, you know when, when the patients are in PACU and they call and say the patient's hypotensive, I'm encouraging, you know, the use of uh, POCUS to help guide um, management. I've used it in the OR sometimes as well. And, you know, just again, hypo, unexplained hypotension, I can't quite figure it out. So I, I definitely am starting to use it more. I definitely could keep using it a little bit more than I am, um, but it is a useful tool. Um, and just, you know, 
great to use the ultrasound and check out the anatomy and teach the residents. And um, it seems like um, at our institution, we've actually started a um, sort of a POCUS team. Of, there's a few attendings that feel comfortable with this, and then they're actually uh, working with the PACU resident, and they sort of practice on the PACU patients, kind of going around mm -hmm. checking people. But then if somebody needs something in the operating room, they can run in there and kind of give guidance. Nabil, have you guys started incorporating that more uh, as a regimented thing, or is it still kind of individuals exploring no, well, it started as individual, but now it starts to get to find its way to the resident education. Yeah. So uh, we're starting with the intern. So the interns rotate with us in the acute pain service for two weeks, and uh, we're starting to we are uh, expanding like you know, the rotation and part of their didactics that they should be doing um, a certain number of uh, ultrasound on the lungs and a certain amount of ultrasound on the heart, and that should be documented as part of the rotation. Um, so, and also on the residents after their internship here, uh, an effort mainly led by our critical care colleagues that there's going to be a rotation, whether it's going to be the PACU residents or when they rotate through the critical care, but they're going to have like you know, a dedicated didactics for focus. That's great. I'm going to tack on this next um, poster because it's still talking about focus, but for lung ultrasound. So this is... Yeah. And one one, and I'm going to put the link up here. Um, so this one um, is a coming from the uh, where is this coming from? Oh, Medical University of South Carolina. It's called One Step Ultrasound Evaluation of Hemidiaphragm Elevation Immediately Following Interscaling Peripheral Nerve Block. So this wasn't a complication, sort of an assessment of someone at high risk, a 61 year old woman having a large sarcoma uh, resected from the proximal humerus and um, uh, had a past medical history significant. So pretty severe COPD, not on oxygen, but 135 pack year history and chronic opioid dependence. They did an interscaling block, but what they did is they did um, uh, ultrasound of the diaphragm pre-block, post-block, and then sort of post-block in two stages to kind of see what happened to the diaphragm from the interscaling block and did it continue to get worse? And then what were the clinical implications for that? Um, I'll zoom in on the picture here in a second, but in the diagram, they actually show where they marked where the diaphragm was pre-block um, at the level of T8, then at 10 minutes after the block and 20 minutes after the block as the diaphragm's resting position kind of moved higher up the chest. Um, and, and they showed that even though clinically the patient was fine, um, they did notice a significant loss in uh, diaphragmatic tone from that single shot interscaling block. Um, Nadia, I'll start with you again because um, uh, you do more point of care ultrasound than the rest of us. Um, seems like lung ultrasound is low hanging fruit for people doing point of care ultrasound, and this is an interesting intersection with regional anesthesia. This diaphragmatic concern with interscaling blocks. I think it's um, it's very useful because if you have a patient who's had an interscaling block and now they're having trouble in the PACU. Um, you can incorporate point of care ultrasound in many ways, but looking at the diaphragm um, to see if in fact the, that ipsilateral diaphragm is not contracting is helpful. What happened to us once is we found that the patient actually also had bilateral pleural effusions while we were looking for diaphragmatic function. Um, so it is helpful to evaluate everything. And if you already know that you're, you have dropped one of the lungs, or not dropped one of the lungs, but you have taken out one of the diaphragms, at least know that that's your baseline for when you evaluate them post-op when they have a lot of trouble. Um, I wanted to comment about, about the last case also is that we we're trying to incorporate a preoperative exam. And I wonder if they had done um, DVT ultrasound uh, scanning for that patient had they found that clot preoperatively, if that would have changed the management. Uh, it's something we talk about in a trauma center when you're doing your pre-op um, can you do a quick exam of the heart? Can we look at the lungs? Um, and should we also be evaluating for uh, deep vein thrombosis um, in these trauma patients that are coming to the operating room? Sorry, I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> uh, interesting, interesting question. Um, Jamie, I, I don't, I, I know personally we haven't introduced um, um, assessment of diaphragm with ultrasound, but it's something I keep wanting to do. Um, I don't know if you guys had a couple of occasions to test that out yet or not. Um, we've played around with it, but not too much. We haven't. It's not 
Um, we actually, most of our upper extremity isn't really done at my hospital anymore, so we don't really do as many interscalings these days. So um, not as much opportunity there. And, you know, the the times that it comes up in my mind is when there's somebody with contralateral um, problems with their diaphragm. And then uh, that's where I've I've sort of taken the moment and said, hey, you know, this is probably a good time to ultrasound both sides, see where the diaphragms are resting at both sides, how much um, difference is there already before we ever do a block. And then you could sort of monitor not just their loss of function, but their regain of function after the fact. Um, th this one, I I'm still trying to figure out where it fits into my clinical practice, but it's an interesting concept. Um, but it's, it's really intriguing that there's definitely a diaphragmatic effect from interscaling blocks this many years away, ultrasound, targeted approach, all this, it still happens. Nabil, any thoughts on this one? Uh, no, just like, you know, some thoughts on the application. So, uh, I agree with you. It's just, especially if you're just starting on the podcast, like myself, the regional anesthesia is a perfect setup for that. You do the block and just before you put your ultrasound down, you have your residents, you just bring them to the bedside and just, you just put your ultrasound probe, like, you know, and just see the diaphragm and compare it. It's just, uh, especially if it's not the first start case, right? And that really is a very good uh, start for anybody who wants to get their skills up. And we have a comment, and this is jumping the gun on tomorrow's uh, uh, abstracts, but high thoracic ESP may replace interscaling block and with no loss of diaphragmatic function on that side. Be an interesting, um, you know, assessment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate whether that's actually going to do what we're hoping to do, and um, depending on how high you get, I mean, presumably you wouldn't get the uh, the phrenic nerve, but who knows? Um, all right, let's go to the next poster, and what I think what we'll do is we'll do two more. Um, the last two had a little bit more of a chronic pain bent to them, so I'm going to skip those for right now since we're focusing on acute pain and regional. Um, but this one, uh, this next one is the abstract number 728. And here's the link. So this one's about epidural blood patch. So this is an unexpected consequence of an epidural blood patch for a postural puncture headache. Um, in this case, uh, this is somebody who had a diagnostic um, lumbar puncture done for concern of uh, uh, meningitis, I think a fungal meningitis, um, and then presented uh, with a um, uh, significant posterior puncture headache uh, afterwards. And I think the day after post op or post procedure day one, they decided to do an epidural blood patch because the symptoms were severe. Um, they did it under fluoroscopic guidance, do an L2 three. Um, epidural blood patch, only 12 mLs of blood was used, sterile blood was used into the space while they were communicating with the patient. And then two days later, she developed a worsening headache, nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity, malaise, and increased um, cervical spine pain, uh, admitted for increased ICP versus rule out meningitis. And then when they did um, a further evaluation, had papilledema, light sensitivity, nausea, everything consistent with increased uh, intracranial pressure. Um, on her CT scan, they had findings consistent with um, increased intracranial pressure as well. So the, the authors here kind of reflect on the fact that um, epidural blood patches are far from uh, benign, and one of the potential consequences is actually worsening headache and in, in, uh, increased intracranial pressure um, due to the epidural blood patch itself. Uh, I personally have not seen this, but uh, I'll say uh, at the beginning of this conversation that whenever I have someone that I'm evaluating for a postural puncture headache, I spend a lot of time scaring the living daylights out of them before I do it. Um, <laughs> my feeling is, is if I can scare them with every potential terrible thing that could happen from doing the blood patch and they still want it, they probably need it at that point. And that's sort of how I rule out my patients that are um, sort of soft calls on that. Um, uh, Jamie, any, I, I don't know how many blood patches you guys have to handle over there, but we get, I feel like we get consulted once a week on it from somebody poking at somebody's spine. So, yeah, I think we get consulted that in almost any headache we get consulted on <laughs> frequently for, it's gotta be, um, an, a, a postural puncture headache. So I think, you know, even if it was just a spinal or whatever it may have been. So I think anything is almost always blamed on that. If there's any needle that went anywhere near their back. Um, but 
I agree. I think the approach has to be, you know, we have to fully evaluate it and make sure the patient understands the risks because, you know, while this is a treatment for posterior puncture headache, it's not without its risks. I think and the patients may often think that I just want this headache going and, and, you know, that sounds fine, but we have to really always explain the risks to them. And um, nothing is benign. Yeah. Nadia, um, you know, I, I don't know if this fell into my radar of risks that I normally talk to people about increased intracranial pressure. Is that something that you guys routinely educate people on? No, not usually. Um, we really, have, we really avoid doing blood patches. It's probably because I'm a regional anesthesiologist. And so I always push to do some sort of nerve block instead. Um, and there's usually resolution of symptoms. I mean, very rarely do they need or progress to you know worsening headache or have a headache for longer that requires blood patch eventually. Um, so when we do counsel them, you know, we go over all of the risk factors. I've never mentioned this before. <laughs> Cranial nerve dysfunction, but not this. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to hold on to them for the next abstract because it addresses, uh, yeah. it, it starts talking about that topic here in a second. But um, uh, Nabil, the uh, things that struck me about this is one, they did this the day after, after only one day of conservative um, uh, therapy. And then the second is, is that it, this happened with only 12 mLs of blood. I know that my t general technique that I tell our residents is that you want to try to aim for 20 if the patient can tolerate it. And some of my colleagues I know go up higher than that. Um, does this give you a little bit of apprehension about epidural blood patches more than even normal? And also what gave me apprehension about this case? Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. But also they did it in the setting of ruling out meningitis. So there are, there is already like you know, some infection going and yeah. there you are introducing like you know, some more, um, like you know, blood into that space. Um, and I think like, you know, the, I agree with all the comments on the right side. Like, you know, when you discuss like, you know, the next poster, um, this is actually have been like, you know, my newly found like, you know, toy that, uh, that I tried. I, I'm not going to say that we tried it too much, but I tried it a couple of times and it actually uh, did work for us. Yeah. So let's jump to the next poster to continue this conversation. So this is poster number 832. Um, and let me grab the link real quick. So this one is kind of an interesting therapy for epidural um, or uh, postural puncture headache. So this is uh, coming from Cleveland Clinic, um, postural puncture headache with atypical presentation and then the role of sphenopalatine ganglion block in postural puncture headache management. So in this patient, they had an unusual presentation, uh, not a typical um, postural puncture headache. This was a um, uh, post-gestational uh, woman who had a lumbar epidural but also had scoliosis and had multiple attempts at the epidural placement, difficult placement, um, had significant headache um, the day after, but the difference compared to normal is that it was worse when she was lying down, better when she was sitting up, opposite of what we normally think of, did have neck stiffness, um, and that was actually almost worse than her headache. Um, afebrile, was walking around, able to eat, um, and no other neurologic deficits, but had very, very um, poor relief from other conservative management. When they talked about a blood patch, there was a lot of reluctance given the fact that she was difficult to begin with and had scoliosis. Um, and then they attempted the sphenopalatine ganglion block. Um, they used 2% lidocaine gel with quarter percent bupivacaine, um, I think on a some sort of sponge or stick or something like that. I'm not sure they didn't say it here. Um, and inserted it through the uh, nasopharynx and did the block and she got relief for 24 hours. Um, but then it came back and then they tried to repeat it. They actually sent her home with the ability to do the blocks on her own at home. So she could repeat it over and over at home eventually. Um, and she kept refusing the epidural blood patch. She came back and uh, was still feeling bad. I think they ended up trying the epidural blood patch at some later date, um, and that actually didn't help all that much either. Um, but an interesting conversation about the sphenopalatine uh, block and how it works. Um, uh, Nabil, you want to start with this one, uh, as you were alluding to. 
yeah. for the questions that came up on the stream, just so I uh, address those. So we had a couple questions about, are you offering Sphenopalatine blocks? Um, same question, uh, another place. And then I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to say this next question because I said our rules were not to talk about COVID-19, but given that this is in the nasopharynx um, and could be considered an aerosol generating procedure, do you hesitate to do this and now that uh, we're worried about spray in your face? Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, so the short answer is yes, we have started doing like, you know, with the, the spinal uh, palatine ganglion block, but I don't do it like, you know, with the described technique with the needle insertion, we do it like similar to what they describe. So we put the local anesthetic on the tip of a Q-tip. It's one of the longer Q-tip that they use for samples. All right. And just, we put it and we put it like, you know, all the way, like, you know, through, uh, each nearest, um, Again, I'm going to tell you a story, another story now, right? <laughs> so uh, my story, like, you know, the first one I did was almost my back to the wall. Okay, this was somebody after a thoracic triple air repair, and that young lady had a spinal drain. And, oh, wow. And post-op, she was fully anticoagulated. Okay, wow. so so the fact that, like, you know, that uh, epidural blood patch was not even an option. Right. We tried the conservative management. We tried, like, to do whatever. And then, like, you know, go into the meeting, like, you know, talking to people, just uh, essentially reading about this phenopalatine ganglion block. So we did do it, like, you know, with this lady, remarkable results. And she actually, it lasted, like, you know, more than 24 hours. She did, she never had the headache back again. So lo and behold, like, you know, the It never came back. She it saw the drain out. in? Even She's with the a, drain still in? No, the drain, like, you no, know, came out. The drain oh, was okay, out. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh the, the next case like you know we had we were consulted so i said okay we did that thing and it worked so uh, it didn't work the first time like you know, the, ne the next case but when we repeated it it actually did like you know, a very remarkable effect so our results has been you can say like you know 60 40 so far but in a very very low number but yeah. i i think it just definitely has a potential for something to try before you jump into that draw blood patch Nadia, what do you have? You guys tried this yet on anybody? Yes, we have, we offer blocks to all the headache consults that we get, um, and I have a very similar experience with the you know, palatin ganglion blocks, like 50-50, I would say, um, especially for the postural puncture headache. Um, so we've been exploring outside of that, doing high thoracic erector spinal plane blocks and cervical fascial plane blocks, and, and it seems like if you can get local um, to sort of stop the, the wind up that happens with headache, you may have a good chance of terminating it despite the duration of the local being such a short acting um, medication. So we've had success um, only probably of, of the, I don't know, 20 or so headache blocks that we've done. We've only had one that did not work. Um, really? That wasn't a you know, palatine ganglion block. Oh, okay. Did you guys, um, and are you guys actually doing injections or are you using the Q-tip kind of solution or? For sphenopalatine ganglion? Um, yeah. We do both. For the, for the headaches, we've been just doing the Q-tip. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the 50-50 efficacy. Yeah. Um, doing a, a, a percutaneous injection. I've never done that for a posterior puncture headache uh, through the cheek. We've only done it for um, mandible surgery and um, maxillary surgery. But uh, I feel like the, the the posterior blocks are more helpful. Yeah, I, I and I wonder about um, teaching people to do this on their own at home. That was kind of an interesting thing. I didn't know you could convince somebody to stick a needle, you know, through their nose, or I mean, a, even a cotton swab all the way back to the back of their nasopharynx. Although you know, the world is getting used to that now. They're all getting sampled. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a growing number of people that are comfortable with stuff getting stuck down their nose. Jamie, have you guys tried this yet? I know we've done a couple of patients, but not a lot. We've, we've done some, you know, um, definitely seen some success. Uh, several have had to be repeated a couple of times before they seem to have worked. Um, so, you know, at some yeah, point it's had... hard to say how much placebo effect they are as well. Yeah. There was a comment here about, uh, somebody had to come in three times because uh, they kept having to do it. And I wonder, you know, if, if this becomes more common, like, is this something that should be done in our pre-op clinic or something like that? Like they don't have, 
you know, it seems like a waste to send them to an urgent care or an emergency room every time they have to come in for a repeat. Seems like a, a better place. I think we've sent one of our patients to our chronic pain clinic, and they do them repeats uh, in the pain clinic there. But uh, I'm surprised. Has anybody ever tried uh, like a nasal spray or something like that that would do the same thing? Would it reach that far? Mm-hmm. I don't know if it would reach far enough to cause that effect. Um, seems like a... a it, it you know for somebody who's done blood patches for so long seems like a stupid simple solution um, for something that's been such a uh, difficult problem for so long you know yeah. and and honestly my mind goes to can I leave something in there and then hook that up to a pump and just have it just periodically just soak the tip of that Q tip you know somehow I don't know if patients would let me do that but it seems like uh, you know it's too too darn easy to to solve this problem with just something touching the back of the nasopharynx, but um, shouldn't shouldn't work. But it seems to apparently for some people. Yeah. Any last thoughts on this one? Well, um, I think that's it for today. Um, I want to thank all of you guys uh, for joining. It's always wonderful to see you uh, as close to in person as we can um, in these times of being far away. Um, and, uh, tomorrow at 3 PM, uh, Eastern time, we're going to be doing this again. Like I said, the topics are going to surround, uh, erector spinae blocks, which seem to be a, yeah. uh, still hot topic for the last two years. Um, and, uh, a lot of posters came through. We're not even going to be able to address, you know, one fifth of the posters that were submitted on erector spinae blocks, but we're going to try to get a sample of it and see some of the wild and crazy stuff people are doing using those blocks at different parts of the yeah. back. Um, but I think that'll be great. So I hope you guys can join us and watch at that time and uh, submit questions and stuff too along the way. Uh, Nadia, Jamie, thank you for joining today. Thank you. It was you. great to see you again. Thank you. Um, and uh, Nabil, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow and uh, we'll, thank you. we'll do it again. I love, I love the background music, by the way. Can you hear my daughter's piano? Yes. Is it, is it coming through? It, it is, actually. It's, it's very nice. Just a little bit. She's, she plays quite well. She's having yeah, music lessons she over... She's having music lessons over Zoom these days. So At least you know that your money is... Uh, it's worth the investment. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I need to start, get her to start making soundtracks for me or yeah, something like you that. Go. You know, but... Yeah. Anyway, good to see you guys. Take <laughs> care. Stay you. safe. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you Take again care. soon. Stay safe. All right. Bye. Bye.